So before we get into this week's episode, I wanted to take a second to tell you guys about the Wholesale Challenge. Now the Wholesale Challenge is our seven day live training on how to start, scale, and manage a fully remote seven figure Amazon wholesale business. Now, we already conducted this year's live training. We're not gonna be holding it live again in 2023, but we did record the entire session and we're offering those recordings to people that missed the live session. So you can go over to wholesalechallenge.com and check that out for yourself. It is gonna include over 25 hours of wholesale training content plus Q&A. We also included over $3,000 worth of bonuses to make it an absolute no-brainer. And some of those bonuses are things like our VA playbook, so it's my PDF guide on how to st- uh, how to find, hire, and manage rockstar virtual assistants. There's going to be the trade show playbook on how to dominate trade shows as an Amazon seller. There's going to be a list of SOPs, which are standard operating procedures, a KPI guide, which are key performance indicators, and so much more, as well as access to a 600-member Facebook community that's active on a daily basis, membership into our Twitter community that has about 300 people in it that is also incredibly active, and just a lot of value for the price. So guys, if you're interested in that, head over to wholesalechallenge.com, and you can get your copy of the replays today. So with that, let's get... All right, welcome back to this week's episode of the Amazon. Amazon Wholesale Podcast. So this week's guest is Andrew Hewitt, and he works, or he actually owns a company called YoDev. And YoDev is a website development and SEO company. He's worked with clients like Uber, State Farm, some other really big, well-known companies. And obviously, he's not an Amazon wholesale seller, but I wanted to bring him onto the podcast because one of the most common questions I get and one of the biggest objections that newer sellers have is how do I start my website, right? What website do I need? Do I even need a website at all? So these are really common questions that people have, ones that I think Andrew is very uniquely suited to answer. So I wanted to have him on to talk all things websites for the next 30 minutes or so. So Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. Corey, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to to get into this topic. Yeah, well, this topic is really your area of expertise, right? This is something you live and breathe, you do it every day. And just to give people a quick background on how Andrew and I originally got connected. So I'm a part of a networking group. I mentioned this group before, but we meet once a month uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It is other CEOs of different companies. And Andrew was actually brought in as a guest speaker about, uh, I want to say about two months ago. And his presentation was really hit home for a lot of the business owners there because a lot of the business owners in the room, they have websites, but maybe they're old, they're outdated, they're not up to par as far as the SEO and some of the capabilities that could really get them found by some of their target customers. And us as Amazon sellers and as wholesale sellers in particular, as everyone knows, our primary storefront is our Amazon storefront. So people listening to this might think, well, I sell on Amazon, why do I need a website? So I think that Andrew's going to make a pretty convincing argument as to One, why you need a website, and two, how you need to structure it a certain way, both for credibility, for branding purposes, and just for having a legitimate business presence online. So that is something that we're going to delve deep into. And Andrew, I think that kind of leads us right into our first question here. So, I mean, given given online marketplaces like Amazon, right? Like I said, we do all of our sales through Amazon. We sell a very small amount through our own e-commerce website. Why is it that you believe that it's so vital for folks in the Amazon wholesale space like us to have our own dedicated websites? Corey, it boils down to three main reasons um, that you can really, you know, hone in on here. Number one is independence. So you're not going to be relying 100% on the marketplace, the rules, the algorithm changes, things like that. Um, And then you have complete control to give your customer the journey from start to finish on your own platform. So websites sort of like your home base and you can control what's going on there. Number two, diversification. So um, not putting all your eggs in one basket per se. So having a direct source on your website to sell and to promote to customers is really big. Backup cases in case there's any issues with Amazon, like what if your account gets suspended or something like that? Like it'd be really nice to have a, you know, a website to fall back on to so that your cash flow doesn't go too down when that when those situations happen because i'm sure they do is that something that can happen sometimes totally and in fact that is every amazon seller's number one biggest fear is that their account gets shut down and so what you're saying is by having your own website and so in this case just to clarify for everyone you're obviously referring to like a storefront website yes something like uh and just to use shopify as an example just something that has a shopping cart feature where you're actually physically selling products because one, like you said, it's a way to diversify. So if your Amazon account gets shut down, you can pivot to your online store. And then two, it 
it's an entirely separate sales channel. So if you optimize it properly, if you set it up from an SEO perspective properly, it can be bringing customers straight to you the way Amazon does, but minus all the fees that Amazon charges you. And, that and third, that was the third one, profit margins. You have better yep. profit margins on your own website. So you, you answered the third one right there and you can control your own pricing strategy. Yes, you need to work in the, the processing fees and the Shopify fees if you're going to Shopify, but overall the margins are gonna be much better if you can direct to consumer or, direct, or actually for you it would be direct to a supplier or whoever you're selling to in this case. But like if you're going direct to the customer, your margins are much stronger. Yeah, totally. And I mean, really the bulk of our sales are directly to other customers, uh, just like the individual consumer. We do do some B2B sales. And I know a lot of people in our space do both. They sell to customers, they sell to other businesses too. But the moral of the story is having your own website storefront allows for a lot of flexibility, whereas Amazon can be pretty constricting at times. So let's talk about some ways that, so there, it's very clear the advantages of having just like your own storefront website. But what about if you're doing, let's say 99%, even 100% of your sales through Amazon, right? So you don't really have a need for a storefront or maybe you don't even want to have that secondary channel for whatever reason, what would be the benefit of having just like an informational website that tells suppliers or potential partners, this is who we are, this is how we do it. Like what, what are some benefits there? Yeah, so uh, it, the biggest benefits that you're gonna get from having a website that's not a storefront website and you're, you are relying on the Amazon platform for like you said, 99% of your sales is going to be building your unique identity, uh, building some customer loyalty, and again, having full control over how you are presented to your user. And this all wraps in building a brand. So like if you mm -hmm. have, you, you can build that brand uh, loyalty, the trust, um, and you can control exactly how you how you are. If you know your customer, if it's a specific niche, you can speak to them directly. You can have landing pages and different areas of your journey and content that's tailored towards your customers just to increase that trust factor and then drive them to your Amazon storefront to, to go and make sales. It'll it'll definitely boost that trust factor for your customers and give you that control on how your brand's repre represented online. I completely agree with that as far as it being a big brand building tool, because really at the end of the day, an informational site for people like us in the Amazon wholesale space is going to be geared towards the suppliers that we're working with. Because at the end of the day, everybody knows the good suppliers won't sell to just anybody. So if you have no presence online, if you have no website or even worse, if you have a bad website or an unprofessional looking website, the chances of you working with these top tier suppliers is going to be small. But like Andrew said, if you have a website that is putting out content that educates your suppliers on why they should work with people like you, if it tells suppliers who you are, what you bring to the table from an e-commerce relationship perspective, really, if your website educates and does so in, uh, you know, in a way that convinces them as to your value, it's going to be way more valuable long term for suppliers that are thinking about working with you, especially when they're comparing you to someone that maybe has no website or has a bad website, right? You're really gonna stand out and be positioned that much better. So at the end of the day, having a good informational site is really all about positioning. Is that fair to say? I would say that's fair to say, and this might be diving into another topic that's really related, but um, structuring content around your products and becoming like a, a topical authority, as I like to call it, so becoming like a, a an authority on a specific set of topics or search terms that a user is searching online, you could actually start ranking for like, you know, why this product's great or why it's not, and then drive them to the product on Amazon. And then just, you know, you can drive sales and get referrals from your website directly to your Amazon affiliate or your Amazon um, storefront. And that that's another big benefit of like, you know, just having an information site is like having a nice content strategy that's geared towards the types of products you sell, the type of customer that you're selling to, and then also, you know, act as another source of traffic to just drive them to your store, which is, you know, an awesome thing as well. So that's actually an approach that I never considered. So you could almost create an informational site that this, the purpose of the site is to market the products from the brands that you're partnered with. So let's just say, for example, I have an exclusive with brand A, well, part of my value add to brand A could be, hey, we've got a website where we promote our best products from our best brands. It gets X amount of user or visitors per month. And on that website, we're putting out content tailored to your specific products. So not only are we gonna sell your products on Amazon, but 
this content on our informational site is going to educate customers about your products. And then at the bottom of the page or all throughout the page, it's going to push them to purchase on Amazon from us. You yeah. see what I mean? So that can almost be like a fly. And I, I've really never thought about that approach exactly. just now, but that could have a big flywheel effect because if that website is being managed properly, if you're doing the SEO right, then the, I would think the number of visitors to that site is going to increase on a monthly basis, which is going to drive more visitors, which is going to drive more sales, which at the end of the day is going to increase the sales of those brands that you're working with and make them want to work with you even more. So that's an entire approach that I, I never even considered. Exactly. And um, it's really popular to do this sort of approach in the affiliate marketing game. So like yep. affiliate marketers will build niche blogs that are tailored to, to the um, affiliates that they're you know promoting, and then they'll drive traffic to through their affiliate links. But the overall goal here is to, to, to provide your users with the most value around making a decision for those products so that like, you know, when they search on Google, they know what they're looking like. They know exactly what they're looking for. If your website answers that in a, in a post or however you're answering that and, and you're linking to products that you're recommending or that they're actually on the fence of like, you can actually like with these SEO tools, you can see if a search term is either an informational search term, right. a commercial search term, which is like, they're like, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm like investigating brands or transactional, like they're looking for product pricing. And then you can actually gear that post towards that to try and drive them to your store or in the affiliate marketing game, drive them to your affiliates, you know, place where they can check out. And, you know, Amazon has an affiliate um, program that's really popular. And that's like that. That's a big strategy on that end. But you could use it in this case as well. Totally. And, and also just to kind of take a slightly separate approach. So if you didn't want to if you wanted your informational site to be geared towards why suppliers should work with you and the value that you bring to suppliers. So like right now, our website, gobrandrocket.com, that is our informational site. And to be completely honest with you, it needs an overhaul. It uh, it doesn't load very quickly. I'm sure it doesn't perform very well from an SEO perspective. But if we were to go in and really make a proactive uh, priority to, to say, all right, we're going to, let's just, for example, sake, say we're going to start a blog on gobrandrocket.com. And every week we're going to create a blog post that talks about things that brands should be doing to improve their sales on Amazon. And obviously our intention with those posts would be so that if a brand owner is searching for those topics on on Google, they find our website, they read our blog posts, and then maybe they decide, okay, well, I, I understand what to do, but maybe I don't understand how to do it. And maybe I'd rather just have Brand Rocket do it for me, right? Because they're the ones that educated me. I found their website. They look like they know what they're doing. Maybe I'll schedule a call, right? Yes. So that I think that is probably the more like traditional approach when it comes to informational websites in our particular space. And like we said, the strategy that we talked about right before this, using it as a way to promote uh, brand exclusive products, I think is an entirely separate uh, direction that could work very well also. Yep. And so let's touch on, so I know you're you're an SEO expert, right? That That yep. is one of your main, one of the main focuses of your business. So is my understanding correct? And I, I know it goes more deep than this, but is it as simple as, okay, well, if I want to drive more people to my website, whether it's a storefront, whether it's an informational site, is all I have to do just create a blog uh, and then post, you know, once a, once a day or so, not once a day, but a, once a week, couple times a week, and then just have people find me that way? Like, how does that work exactly from an SEO perspective? Um, so technically to answer your question, yes, you can just create content around what you're selling and who you're talking to. And in, you know, you will get traffic as a result of doing that practice. Just by having content period. Just by creating content, but it's almost like you're shooting in the dark. So uh, the appropriate approach to, to execute this effectively would be to, when you're writing your content and creating your content calendar, you need to have some sort of like direction. You need to put your map together, your content mm -hmm. map. Um, I like to call it a content cluster. Like you pick a, you pick a certain topic that you really want to focus in on. And then there's tools that'll, and I can share some of the tools with you, Corey, if, if, if you're interested, but there's tools that'll take that keyword, analyze how much traffic it is, and then give you a, a subset of a ton, a ton of other topics that you can post on your website. That'll create what's called a, a content cluster. And this content cluster helps you to build more topical authority on Google to show that your domain is an, is an expert and has authority in this certain topic. So planning there, and then also there's tools that'll help you 
analyze content against competitors. And the more you can improve that content score that some of these tools will give you, the better chance you have to, to rank on Google. And there's also things to consider like keyword difficulty. Um, you know, they, it ranges from 0% to 100%, 100% being the hardest to rank for. And that's like when you, you know, when you're up against the Amazons themselves, right. it's like, you know, like they're, they're going to obviously beat you out on like really popular keyword terms, but there's long tail terms that like people might be asking what's better this or that, or mm -hmm. what's better that they're the ones where you can, you can easily go and get some traffic from. Um, so having that strategy in place up front. And then having some tools to help you assist to build the highest quality content. That's not going to be like, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the traditional way of SEO where they call it keyword stuff. And go, oh, don't I just yep. put the keyword 20 times in here and I'm good to go? No, that's the quickest way to not rank ever anymore. Like that's just And that's how Amazon used to work. So yeah. back in the early days of Amazon, when these private label sellers were creating their own brands from scratch, they knew which keywords they had index for, same as you would on with Google. And that you would find a bunch of listings with a bunch of titles that don't really sound coherent, right? It just sounds like you said, it's a bunch of keywords stuffed into a title. And Amazon caught on pretty quickly as did Google and that no longer works. And so you're saying that it's not enough to just stuff a bunch of keywords into a blog post. Nope. They've got to be relevant. They've got to drive traffic. They've got to, and will Google take it as far as like when somebody clicks on your blog, if they bounce quickly, will Google penalize you for that? Like if they don't stay on the page for very long? They used to. So this is very recent actually so um recently in the past i think it's like been two or three months it might have actually been even after the we met um that this recently rolled out so google's finding out that just because a user bounces from your website doesn't necessarily mean they had a poor experience it actually might mean that they found exactly what they were looking for really quickly and like it mm -hmm. achieved what google's looking to do which is share information and give users what they're looking for in the most efficient and effective way. Um, so Google actually, I don't know if anybody's seen this yet, but if you find something on a website and then you bounce pretty quick, sometimes you get a little pop-up. It's like a little survey. It says like, how was your experience? And it's like a little happy face or a negative face. Mm -hmm. And if a user clicks, it was great. I found what I'm looking for. That actually sends a positive signal. So the bounce rates right now, they're not really a negative signal anymore. It's it's more it's it's all about like if you can just focus in on producing high quality content that your users are looking for, um, and you're giving them that value, and they're having a good time on your website. Like your website's not taking a long time to load. Things aren't shifting around on them. Ads aren't attacking them constantly. Um, you're gonna you're gonna have success as long as you have some sort of strategy and like an intention for for writing the content and structuring it. Um, but yeah, so to kind of go around all that um, and kind of wrap it all in, have you ever heard of NLP? It's a part of Google's. Uh, I don't think so. No, I'm not sure if Amazon. I'm interested if Amazon rolled something out like this. So NLP stands for Natural Language Processing. Hmm. So it's a model that's worked into Google's algorithm that will actually scan your content and read to see if it sounds natural or not, or if you're just trying to stuff keywords or put random headings in there and, and that don't make sense. So it'll actually read your whole post and it'll give you an NLP sort of score that's like, okay, is this natural? Can you read this naturally? Does it make sense? Um, and that's, that's really big too. I'm not sure how Amazon's algorithm works for SEO and stuff. I haven't actually had time to dive into that area. But I would assume they'd have some sort of thing because, like you said, they don't do keyword stuffing anymore, right? So they must have some right. sort of way to analyze the content to see if it's authentic, if it's valuable, if it's like, you know, representing the product or whatever you're trying to rank for in the right way. Yeah, exactly. And and also just so everyone listening to bring this back to Amazon Wholesale because they might think that we're getting a little in the weeds as far as websites are concerned. But I think this is super relevant to what we're doing on a day to day basis, because at the end of the day, everybody that sells on Amazon, know, if they're not a private label seller, right, if they're a wholesale seller or an arbitrage seller, that we we don't have a way to build a brand identity on Amazon. It, it, we are a commodity. We are only fighting after the buy box, which comes down to fulfillment method and lowest price really at the end of the day. So if you want to give suppliers a reason to work with you, as opposed to the other hundred people, you know, fighting over their listings on Amazon, you've got to have a presence that shows you're legitimate, that shows you're professional and having a really good, well done professional website is the easiest way to do that. 
because a lot of times, like even when I'm reaching out to suppliers, right? Before they even reply to me and, and definitely before they agree to get on a call with me, the first thing that they're doing is they're looking at what, where did my email come from? So Corey at gobrandrocket.com. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to go to gobrandrocket.com and check out the website and see what it, see what we're about, see what we have to offer, see if we'd be a good fit. And like I said earlier, our website can use some work, but it's not terrible and it gets the job done, right? We've gotten relationships from it. We've gotten suppliers from it. And but it's always some, it's really a constant, uh, a thing that can be constantly improved, right? And Andrew, I know that that's something you and I discussed, like SEO in particular, it's an ongoing process. What? So let's let's just assume that somebody here, somebody listening to this podcast, they've got their website in place. Let's say it's an informational site and it's geared towards suppliers, why suppliers should work with them. Is it a set it and forget it type thing where once that website's up, they're good to go and they can just pretty much forget about it? Or is it something that they're going to have to maintain on an ongoing basis? And if so, what does that ongoing maintenance look like? Uh, so as far as setting it and forgetting it, uh, I'm going to say there's no no way. Don't do that with a website. Uh, setting and forgetting is probably going to set you up for definitely some like issues. Is if you don't have some sort of mechanism in place or a service provider in place to like maintain an update as far as like packages are concerned like if, when i say packages i'm meaning like uh software packages and stuff mm -hmm. because like if you're not updating on a consistent basis and staying up to date on the latest patches for whatever software you might be using um things like that like definitely consider some sort of host shopify handles all of it so like if you're doing shopify like you don't have to worry but if you're if you're like if you have your own website like on wordpress or something and you're just hosting it on godaddy or some kind of shared hosting platform look into your plugins look into your themes make sure they're being updated on a regular basis and if that's if that's something that like you don't want to touch look for a host like wp engine uh kinsta these types of hosts, they have automatic updates that like just will push push updates out automatically. And then if you ever have any technical issues, you can easily open up a chat and an actual technical engineer will join your chat. You won't be on a customer service rep with GoDaddy or Bluehost or any of those other traditional shared hosting providers. So set it and forget it. Like if you have a nice looking site, it's a brochure, it looks great. That you can set and forget that if you're not looking to grow any organic traffic on a routine basis and you just want that nice looking brochure to, to drive prospective, you know, clients or customers. But mm -hmm. when it comes to like the actual software behind it and the security, make sure you're choosing a platform or a host that can handle automatic updates and then also have some sort of technical support rep that can be really like responsive. That like, because if something happens, you want to be able to say, hey, something's happening. I got a critical error on my website. Like, can you look into it? You want to be able to do that. You don't want to be like, Oh, well, you're not on a, 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 a package that allows me to do this. So do you want to upgrade? You know, you don't want to right. do it. like find the host that already has all that built in. That's the best. That's the best approach for maintaining it over time. I think that's a great tip because I mean, I know for a fact, our website, I believe our hosting is more just like a GoDaddy or maybe even like a Google domains type generic hosting. And I mean, our site has slowed down over the years because I'm pretty sure because of the fact that we're not updating our WordPress plugins, right? We're not yeah. we're not doing this this simple ongoing maintenance. It sounds like if we had, I'm sure one of those hosting providers that you mentioned that does that ongoing maintenance might be a little more expensive, but for not having to go in and do that manually every month or however often that needs to be done to keep your site quick, to keep it loading quickly, uh, and just to keep it up to date, I think is well worth the investment. Because I don't know about you, but me personally, if I look at a website if i click on a link and the website takes more than like two seconds to load then even even subconsciously i'm probably thinking like okay there's something weird with the site even if it looks professional even if everything about it looks solid in the back of my mind i always am a little bit uh maybe suspicious is the right word only because of that load time and maybe that's just because i'm, I'm geared to think that way because most things work quickly these days but i think a lot of other people probably share that sentiment yeah uh you know how the, the load speed of your website is definitely number one factor of like whether or not it's a legitimate website or not. So if your website's taking longer, like the, like you said, Corey, two seconds is really the, the Google core web vitals that they're ranking your site for. So they'll scan your site. And if, you're, if your site's not responding in, in you know two seconds or less, you immediately get a lower score than a site that would. 
And mm. not only does it, again, instill that like skepticism into your user, but it also is hurting you in the rankings when you're ranking up against a competitor that might have might be on top of their game and they have a blazing fast website with a, a really nice host with all their software up to date and you know that's that sort of thing a lot of times though what happens with a site that takes a long time to load it's just a big bulky design that's all it mm -hmm. is codes taking a long time to load big images and all this other stuff like all that stuff can be optimized fairly you know it's a fairly straightforward development process to get that get that up to speed awesome yeah it's great feedback and good advice for yeah for anybody that's in that boat and so Andrew, we are coming up here. We're about 25 minutes in. So we usually like to cap it around 30 minutes. So we'll get to one of my last questions here. And so that would be this. So let's say you're, let's say somebody's listening to this podcast, right? They're already selling on Amazon. They're a wholesale seller. They, after listening to this, they understand the value of at least having an informational website geared towards suppliers. So if you're that person, what would you, like, what's your first move? And I'm going to assume it's not go to Fiverr and get it done as cheaply as possible, right? If it is, then then tell us why, but tell me what somebody in that position should do. All right, so the, the first thing that I would do when I'm considering if I should get a website as an Amazon wholesaler is what do I want? So do, you, do I want the brochure site or do I see myself going to a, my own storefront eventually? If your goal is to go to your own storefront, just go to Shopify immediately. Like that's just mm -hmm. where you want to go. Or just get there, get it set up, find a, an off, a really good Shopify developer or a team that can handle a shop like Shopify development, and get get some quotes and see what it's going to take to to get your website up and running there. And if you're tech savvy enough, Shopify like if you're not ready to like fully roll out everything, get everything integrated, and you just want to have the brochure aspect on Shopify. They have some really good premium themes that you can just stand up pretty quickly and then you know somebody later can then make it better so that's the number one thing make sure you know like am i going brochure route or am i going storefront route if you're going storefront route just go right for shopify don't do any i like, go oh, well, i'm going to start here on wordpress since it's just a you know a brochure site and it's cheaper and it's open source and it's be it's better for me right now but I want to go there later. It's going to be very. It's going to be more cost. Hard to migrate. Migrate it from a WordPress site to Shopify when you could just you could be on Shopify first. Next right. thing, I'm going to think about design. Just that, and when I talk about design, not really like tons of aesthetics or like graphical elements. I'm talking about like user experience design. So like, mm -hmm. what do I want my users to do here? What's the main goal? Think about that. Have all that worked out. Um, if you're, I'm sure everybody's using ChatGPT. Uh, nowadays, ask ChatGPT what you need to consider, tell them what your goal is, and then, you know, get some ideas there on like on what your user experience needs to be. Um, and then make sure that, you know, um, I don't know, make sure you, like, if, do you have, if you have trust factors, like maybe your products have a lot of good reviews and you have all that stuff, make sure you have that worked into your website just so you can like show like, Hey, like look how awesome, like we are as a seller. Like we have so many good reviews. This is, you know, build, but make sure you're building that seller like feedback. That's that's yeah. actually something I didn't consider is that is incorporating your seller feedback into your website. So you could showcase the fact like yeah. if you've got, you know, 99%, 100% positive feedback. You can showcase that and you could even pull out some specific customer feedback from your storefront. And, and, you know, when customers leave like a really glowing review, you could leave that there and say, hey, look what not only do our suppliers love working with us and the brands love working with us, but also look at the customers that we serve as well, even though we are in the face of Amazon, just another faceless seller, we actually sell good products. We take care of our customers and they can see those results. Exactly. And then above all else, clear call to actions. So at the end of the day, your website, whether it's a brochure to, to build trust with a supplier or a customer who wants to buy a lot of stuff from you or who, whoever it may be landing on your website, or even if it's someone who's just going to buy products from your website, you need to make sure that there's call to actions, whether it is buying a product, but like give them some kind of call to action. If you're if you're building information on your content, give away some kind of a guide, get an email address that'll help you build leads. And it also it'll allow you to, to track the gives you something to track performance on your website, like how many of these form hits are we getting X, Y, Z. So, again, design, make sure you got your user experience you know, out of the way and you know what you're doing. 
Um, then you're moving into um, trust factors. Make sure you're really showing off that trust and who you are, what you do, why people are loving to work with you, your reviews, and then make sure you have clear call to actions. When you have all of that figured out, then go talk to an expert and see how much it's going to cost. So get all, because like that'll save you so much back and forth and so much time. And like, you don't want to go to an expert and then just hope that they know everything about everything. Cause a lot of experts out there might just assume that they know you. And like, if you just blindly trust them, you might not end up getting something that, that you need. So make mm -hmm. sure you do all that legwork in the beginning before moving forward with the website. I think those are great points. And that's a mistake that I made myself before is just blindly trusting experts. And at the end of the day, most experts, are, they're going to want to do right by you. But if you don't know what you want and you can't give them clear guidelines on how to get there, then they're only going to give you their best shot. And a lot of times it's not necessarily aligned with what you need. So I think that's great feedback. And yeah, I think you're spot on. Great. Awesome. So Andrew, we are coming up on the end here. So before we get going, why don't you tell people where they can find you, where they can find YoDev as well? Cool. So um, best way to find me, connect, follow me would be um, YouTube. So I do have a YouTube channel. I, I do content around SEO, AI, website, those sorts of things. So if you're looking to take on a website yourself or work with a, an expert, you can get some really good ideas there and some some tips. So my YouTube channel is just, just search YoDev, capital Y-O-H, capital D-E-V. So YoDev. And you'll find me. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn a lot. So you can get, feel free to go connect with me and start a message. We can chat about stuff. So just search Andrew Hewitt. Um, I should come up. If I don't, Andrew Hewitt development, I will definitely come up. And um, most importantly, Corey, uh, just as a thank you to be on the show, uh, for getting me on the show, uh, I'm offering a free website audit to your audience. So if everybody goes to yodev.com forward slash Corey. So Y O H D E V dot com forward slash C O R E Y. You're going to get a, a free website audit from Yodev. It's going to go over user experience design, technical SEO, performance, relevancy of your content, and then some actionable steps that you can take immediately to improve your, your website's performance. So um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to do that for your audience as a thank you to, to get on the show. Yeah. And so guys, if you're listening to this and you already have a website, whether it's an informational site or whether it's a storefront site, take him up on that offer. That's incredibly generous. Like he said, what he's going to do, he's basically going to tell you what you're doing right with your website, what you're doing wrong with your website and how to fix it. And that is completely free. And you can choose from there whether you want to work with him further. So Andrew, thank you so much, man. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And guys, for anybody that wants to follow me further on Twitter, I'm at Ganim Corey on every other platform, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, etc. I'm at Corey Ganim. So thanks so much for listening and I'll be back next week.